this is how you cross over from Israel to Gaza. And right now we're in no man's land. Prime Minister, do you now regret when once asked what your favourite joke was, you replied Nick Clegg? And Deputy Prime Minister, what do you think of that? Mr Trump, why should you be president? What makes you fit for the role? Is it just one big ego trip? Thank you very much. People aren't sure they can trust what you say. You say your, things is, and then it turns out that they're not quite what you say. My name's Andy Bell and I've been a journalist for over 30 years. In this podcast, I ask how did we get here, taking a story in the news and providing background and context to help understand it better. For this edition, we take a dive into the world of the SPAD, the Special Advisor. What do they do? How much power do they have? And how is Dominic Cummings changing all that? I've been talking to Peter Cardwell, a Special Advisor to four Cabinet Ministers in his time, but he was sacked in the reshuffle from his role as a SPAD to the Justice Secretary. Peter Cardwell, thank you very much for coming in to us here at Millbank, just across the road from Parliament to talk uh, for this edition of How Did We Get Here? Um, about SPAD World. Now, you have been a SPAD for three and a half years, and you work for how many cabinet ministers? Four cabinet ministers, four departments. Okay, and what were those? So we started off at the Northern Ireland office, where I worked with James Brokenshire for about a year and a half. James, very sadly, I'm sure you remember, he got lung cancer and he had to resign and it was actually on his 50th birthday, believe mm -hmm. it or not. Mm -hmm. And I just remember we had a little video for him. I put together a little video for his 50th birthday. And he, you know, we walked out of the building that day. I uh, stayed on, was asked, actually asked to stay on with Karen Bradley for a short period of time just to kind of get her bedded in. She was the new Secretary of State for Northern Ireland. I was with her for sort of eight or ten weeks. I then went to the Home Office with Amber Rudd. And I still have the WhatsApp message from Amber where she sent it round her then four spads. Uh, with, can you look into this Windrush thing? I think it might be a bit problematic. <laughs> and how? And long she was, was right. And she sure was right. She, how long, as a matter of interest, how long before she had to quit was that? I lasted exactly four weeks. But how long after office. that? What's that? Three thing? weeks. A weird series of events where Sajid Javid was in the housing department. He then moved to be Home Secretary. Uh, James wonderfully had, and after, after the brilliant work of, of his doctors, had had his operation, was recovering, back to full strength as he now is, mm -hmm. and he came into the Ministry of Housing, Communities and Local Government, uh, what uh, Dominic Rabb christened Mahoko Loco, <laughs> because it has the longest name of any uh, department in Whitehall, and then I was with James for another roughly year and a half, just shy of a year and a half, <laughs> and then James got sacked. Uh, very sadly, after by Boris Johnson, and then uh, Robert Buckland, the uh, current Justice Secretary, picked me up off the spad scrap heap and uh, brought me into the Ministry of Justice as his special advisor, okay. where I remained until last Thursday. I mean, let's go back to basics. Why, how did you become a special advisor at SPAD? So I knew a woman called Fiona Hill, uh, who is, has had a lot of negative things written about her as uh, Nick and Fee, uh, knee Fee, as mm -hmm. sometimes they were known, uh, Nick Timothy and Fiona Hill, who were Mrs May's uh, chiefs of staff, joint chiefs of staff. But back in the day, when I was uh, uh, younger and thinner, uh, I was a political uh, producer for Newsnight. And some spads weren't great. Some spads would string you along until about five o'clock in the afternoon and then you know, give you a junior minister nobody had ever heard of or whatever. And a lot of that negotiation was, uh, was, was my job. Uh, but Fiona, I always found very, very straightforward. You knew exactly where you were. You knew exactly if Mrs May, then Home Secretary, was going to do the job or not. I remember sitting at my desk in ITV at Good Morning Britain, sending off my CV to Fiona, thinking, I will never hear another word about this. Mm -hmm. She's so busy, she's you know, quite literally running the country. Mm -hmm. A week later, I got the job. Right. And did you know what you were getting into? Did you have an idea of what the job entailed? I had an idea as I'd been a journalist in and around Westminster at that stage for about six years. But with the greatest of respect to you know, people like you, Andy, who know a lot about the political world, you can't really know what it's like to be, I would, I would argue, a Secretary of State or a Special Advisor until you've actually done it. I suppose it's like most jobs, you don't really know what it, what it fully entails, mm -hmm. but the craziness, the R's, the pressure, and the fun, actually, and the, the, the bonds you build, you, don't, you have no real appreciation of that until you get into it. Okay, well, give me an idea then. Of a, it's difficult, I imagine, to have a typical day 
but give me an idea of the sort of day you would have as a special advisor to a cabinet minister. So often you're walking on the tube and you ring the Secretary of State, have a quick chat about what is coming up that day, or maybe there's something you've spoken to them late at night. I mean, the thing especially... So this is like 7.30 in the morning? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Especially mm. with James. Uh, and, and broken a, shower. A, a, a James yeah. Broken shower and a bit with Robert. I mean, they were almost always the last person I spoke to at night and the first person I spoke to in the morning. Mm -hmm. um, Robert Buckland. Obviously. Robert Buckland, yeah. Current Justice Secretary. Yeah. Current Justice yeah. Secretary, yeah. So uh, then you get the tube, go to work, uh, you will have a morning meeting usually in terms of what's coming up that day. Morning meeting with um, who? In the department? With, sorry, yes, with the Secretary of State. With, uh, there's a thing called private office, which is um, you've got the principal private secretary who's the, the, quite a senior civil servant who basically runs the Secretary of State's life. Your relationship with the principal private secretary is absolutely crucial as a special advisor. And if you don't get on with that person, and more accurately, if the Secretary of State doesn't get on with that person, the PPS has to go. But the people who literally run the Secretary of State's life are the private secretaries. They're often young, very well educated, very dedicated people who work really long hours, mm -hmm. and they're and the, the 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 top person is the principal private secretary, mm -hmm. and I was very lucky to work with a number of them who were really mm -hmm. really good, and every they're the sort of interface between uh, the secretary of state and the special advisors to the department. So okay, but that so that, that that's a civil servant working to the minister, isn't that enough? People might look at this and say, why do you need somebody like you, a special advisor? What, what, what purpose are you serving? So every civil servant within their contract and you know, the way they are is that they're impartial. So there are 77,000 civil servants uh, for the Ministry of Justice, if you include everybody, including all the prison officers. Um, there are two special advisors. Uh, you are a party political person. Uh, I am a member of the Conservative Party, card-carrying member and you give political advice. So the civil servant will say something like, this is a good policy, um, you know, it makes perfect logical sense, we've got the money for it, we should do this, we should open this prison in wherever. And you say, well, I'm your political advisor and I'm telling you that if we build a, um, if we build a prison in wherever, the local MP is gonna go absolutely ballistic, we're gonna lose a vote in parliament, he or she has the ear of 10 other people who will vote against us on something else. And your value as a special advisor is that you're the voice, two things, you're the voice of your minister. So often civil servants will come up to you and say, what does Robert or James or whoever, what does the Secretary of State think about X? And you should know. And if you don't know, you're the person who can sometimes have this sometimes slightly difficult conversation to actually find out what they think. And secondly, your connection to number 10. Okay, and who pays all your wages? You do, the taxpayer. Um, every special advisor uh, gets a public salary, but there's a weird definition, which is, and often people ask me, you know, what's it like being a non-official, extra civil service, public appointee, seconded to the Secretary of State in an advisory role? And my answer is always the same. Can't we just call a spad a spad? Nice one. Okay, right. But no, listen, you're, you're, you're well paid, and I have no complaints about what I was paid. You are well paid to do a fascinating job mm. at the heart of government where you have a lot of influence. Okay, I mean, and your loyalty, presumably, is to your minister, first and foremost? Yes, but it also, if you don't believe in the wider project, you shouldn't be there. Mm. And that, often, there are tensions between departments and number 10. Certainly, that was the case under the May administration less so under the Johnson administration. Uh, but yes, you've got to believe in, you, as a special advisor, you have two approvals. So you have the approval of your Secretary of State who wants you to do the job. You've got to have the approval of number 10. Uh, I, in my case, and we can talk about this if you want, lost the approval of Downing Street. Well, you've raised it, and uh, the case with you, the, the, the approval for you as a special advisor was withdrawn. What was the process and why did that happen? Uh, so the process was that... Uh, Robert went to Downing Street in the most recent reshuffle. Robert uh, Buckland. That, sorry, Robert, Robert Buckland, apologies. Sorry. Uh, Robert Buckland, the current Justice Secretary, went to Downing Street uh, on Thursday last week and was told, you're continuing as Justice Secretary uh, by Boris Johnson. He then, uh, this is the version of events I've been told by Robert, I have no reason to doubt it whatsoever. He came out of the meeting and was told that, uh, not by Boris Johnson, but by a senior person in, in Downing Street, uh, that I'm afraid what's happening is you can keep one of your special advisors, but the other guy, uh, me, 
um, you know, we have to move on, we have to refresh the team, etc. And that approval is going. Okay, sorry, yep. two questions. Yep. Was that senior person Dominic Cummings? Yes. And was it about you personally? Yes. Have you any idea why you lost his approval? I've been told, again, uh, by Robert and others, that it's nothing personal, nothing to do with me as a person. It's simply that they wanted to refresh the team, they wanted a new person uh, to do it. And what has happened is a former uh, special advisor to Pradeep Patel has now moved over to the Justice Department. Um, I mean, there is a very clear focus in this government on justice, home affairs, uh, criminal justice policy. And I think they wanted to marry up the teams a bit, a bit more. Um, that is entirely their prerogative. That I knew that before I got into spatting three and a half years ago. I was chatting to someone from the cabinet office about this actually. And until last week, I believe there were something like 106 special advisors. Have a guess how many of those 106 people had more than two years service? Ten. <laughs> oh, all right. <laughs> so I was going to say about 50. But so I was one 10 of, out of 106. 10 out of 106. So I was, I think it's 106. I was... So you did pretty well from that most, point of view. Most special advisors do not last two years. You are a political mayfly. Mm -hmm. You know that when you get into it. You can be dismissed for basically any reason. But all the same, this must have been pretty hard to take, I mean, wasn't it? Being dumped the day before Valentine's Day? <laughs> um, you know... Uh, listen, I had a great time, a brilliant time with many, made some brilliant friends. Mm -hmm. James Brokenshire is one of my top 10 people in the whole world. Mm -hmm. I had a great time. It was never going to last forever. Has the situation changed with Dominic Cummings running things now? It depends what you mean. From the SPAD point of view. I mean, I've been in Downing Street on a Friday evening thinking, oh, there's nobody here but me. And suddenly all these people, I mean, when I say in Downing Street, literally in the street, uh, suddenly all these people can't trooping in. Yep. And they're coming for SPAD school with Dominic Cummings. They are, On Friday yes. evening at 6. Usually 6, 6.30, something like that. I mean, that's new. It is new. <laughs> um, no, I remember being in the first meeting. It actually wasn't a Friday evening meeting. There was the mm. famous 7.55 a.m. meeting <laughs> one Monday morning. And Dominic stood at the front and said, if you leak, you will be sacked. We, you will be marched from your desk by the... Uh, head of security at your department, your pass will be uh, taken from you and you will have no job, you have no rights. And that supposedly is what happened to, to Sajid Javid's advisor. I mean, she I mean, would I'm deny not, she was leaking, but I'm, that, I'm, that, was the, that was the way she was removed. I'm not going to get into that, Andy, but um, I mean, that's, that's, I think there's litigation possibly in, involved in that, so I'm, not, I'm just not going to get into that. Um, but certainly, look, you know, it, a number of people have clearly fallen foul of Dominic. I've been led to believe I'm not one of them, in fact. Um, and I actually still feel pretty loyal towards him and the previous Secretary of State I, I've worked with. Um, but certainly, um, having been in that 755 meeting, I remember after Dominic said those words, I turned to a friend of mine and just went, we're not in Kansas anymore, are we? <laughs> you know, uh, Gavin Barwell, uh, the previous Chief of Staff under Mrs May, is a lovely man who did a great job, but I think we can all agree he's a very different character to Dominic Cummings. Okay, so there is no denying, well, in your view, I imagine, correct me if I'm wrong, that the set, the hold of the centre and the Downing Street, and in particular Dominic Cummings, over people like you in your previous lives in different departments, has tightened up. Yes, I think that's absolutely right. However, I also think it had to happen. What happened, despite the best efforts of very good people, including Gavin Barwell, in the last, certainly the last six to, six to nine months of the May administration was that there were a load of people leaking like sieves, there were people briefing against cabinet ministers, there were people going off on solo runs and putting their own policies out without them being properly approved by number 10. It was a nightmare. It was very, very difficult time. And the few of us, and I do mean the few of us, who were still loyal to number 10 were the exception. Absolutely the exception. Nevertheless, what about the style of the man in the way he would manage, if I can use that term, spads? I have a seven-year-old nephew, and he works best when there are boundaries and a goal. What came out of that 7.55 a.m. meeting, and basically every other meeting that I was in since with Dominic Cummings, is that it is very clear what the boundaries are. Don't muck about. And similarly, there is a goal, whether it's Brexit, whether it's an election, whatever it is. And if you know the boundaries and you know the goal, that's great. And you can work towards those and you can work within that environment. And with the greatest of respect, 
to the many good people who worked in the Theresa May administration, some of whom are personal friends, within the last six months especially, neither of those things existed. So do you think the Dominic Cummings effect, and let's talk particularly about the, the SPADs and, the, and number 10, has been, from the point of view of running government, positive? I think so. Look, it's not always the most comfortable atmosphere for people. Um, I got sacked, for goodness sake. But at the same time, I think, I think how Dominic has run things with special advisors is a bit of a reflection, or, or perhaps even a continuation, of what the country was saying a few months ago. It was saying, we've had this dither and delay, you know, th th we're a bit rudderless, there are no boundaries, there's no goal. Dominic comes in, takes very clear control, is very clear what he wants. If you fall foul of that, for whatever reason, there will be consequences. But actually, just as the country said, we're giving you an 80 strong majority because we want a strong government. A strong person is the Prime Minister's most senior advisor and he is dealing with things in a very strong way. People have reacted to that, people may not like that, people may not feel that's the job they want to do. If they don't, go and do another job. Do you think government works better for having SPADs? Yes, I think government ministers have huge demands on their time. They're being pulled in loads of different directions and they need someone to watch their back. Basically, they need someone to be their friend. You know, it's the kind of question, you know, when you're, when you're appointing a special advisor, the question the Secretary of State has to ask is, you know, can I spend 24 hours in an airport with this person? Often you give the advice that nobody else can give. You know, the civil servants are great in many ca many, most cases. They're excellent people. But they will only give advice to a certain point. The point where you have to say to your Secretary of State, do you know what? You can actually do with losing a couple of pounds because you're looking a bit fat on TV. Not everybody can do that. And that could be the job of the SPED. Oh, I've said it. I've said it to people. <laughs> we won't ask which one. <laughs> <laughs> um, I guess the other crucial question is, how much power do you have? Because people are going to be listening to this and going, I didn't elect this guy. Yep, absolutely. And yep. it sounds like he's very close mm -hmm. to the centres of power. Yep. Um, so well, how, are, how much power do you have? I, I would argue you don't have power. I would agree. I would argue you have influence. And I think, you know, there is a very strong civil service code in terms of what special advisor can and can't do. I've occasionally been told you can't do that, uh, more at the start than, than, than further in. But essentially, you're asked for your opinion, you're asked for your advice, but at the end of the day, advisors advise and ministers decide. Okay, now we're talking about Dominic Cummings. I mean, in many ways, he's like a, a super spad. Oh, yes. He has power. Oh, he has he power. He has real power. But his power is inextricably linked to Boris Johnson. And, I mean, I've been in a meeting, I was in a meeting um, after the Streatham terror attacks with Dominic, with Boris Johnson, with uh, the Home Secretary, the Justice Secretary, Metropolitan Police and so on. I obvious, For obvious reasons, I can't tell you the content of that meeting. But what I can tell you is that the Prime Minister, as a sort of chairman of the board, basically said... This should not happen, this should happen, this should happen, this should happen. And then Dominic was, spoke more than the Prime Minister, if I remember correctly, and basically said, well, let, how do we get to this point? Who's responsible for this? Bish, bash, bosh, get it done. So it was, it was Cummings, really, who was kind of laying it out. Well, Boris said what he wanted to happen in terms of what was next. He was very, very clear. But in terms of the practical steps that the civil service, the Metropolitan Police and others had to take, um, you know, Dominic's role is to get into the granular detail of that. And that's what a special advisor should do. Okay. What advice would you give to anyone thinking of taking up this job? It's the best job in the world. I loved journalism. I loved being a journalist. I did it for 10 years. But this is another, what I did for three and a half years was another level. Uh, you will be at the front seat of history. Uh, you will meet incredible people. I mean, you know, some of the privileges of it are incredible. I've travelled in the Home Secretary's bulletproof car. I've stayed in embassies. I've met members of the royal family. I've been in 10 Downing Street sometimes three or four times a week. Um, I've sat at the cabinet table discussing major things with the Prime Minister of the United Kingdom. I mean, my dad is uh, from Lurgan in uh, Northern Ireland and he didn't go to birthday parties sometimes because he couldn't afford a second pair of trousers other than his school trousers. 
and his son, I was, this was in my mind when Mrs. May turned to me and said, I'm about to do an interview in Northern Ireland, what should I say? Mm. You know, it is an incredible job. If you get the opportunity to do it, do it. You won't regret it. It's a tough job. It's not easy. Don't expect to do it for very long. You don't expect to do it for very long. As I say, you're a political mayfly, but it is the best job in the world. Would you do it again? Oh, yeah. For the right I'd be lying came along. I, you know, it's like, it's like when an MP says, you know, do, you know, do you want to be prime minister? And you go, oh, well, no, I think I really want to serve as, you know, minister for paper clips. Of course you want to be a prime minister. If someone said to me, will I do it again? Yes. I don't think I'm going to have that opportunity in the short term. You know, I'm only 35. I don't know what's going to happen, nor does anybody else. But um, if I got the opportunity for the right minister, uh, you've, got to do, you've got to work for somebody you believe in. You've got to believe that I, I believe and believe to this day that Robert Buckland is the best person to be Lord Chancellor of the United Kingdom. If I didn't believe that, I wouldn't have worked for him. It didn't hurt when he let you go? No, because it wasn't entirely his decision. Um, Robert's a great guy. Um, you know, I've been, I spoke to him last night on the phone. Uh, I think he'll do a great job. Um, he will continue to, and I hereby predict that Lord Chancellor will not be his last job in government. I'll watch this space. For you, Peter Cardwell, watch this space. Thank you very much for talking to us. Thank you, Andy. Peter Cardwell on the role of the SPAD in a changing political world. Thank you for listening to this edition of How Did We Get Here? If you have any thoughts on this, or if you have any ideas for future podcasts, please email me on andy.bell at itn.co.uk. I'm tweeting on at andybell5news. There'll be another edition along soon.